1990, I was 22, I'd got my first proper job as a BBC News trainee. And I just remember that time being marked by Tory sleaze as one MP died by autoerotic asphyxiation. Anti-gay rhetoric was still very normal, very mainstream. Rave culture was freaking out my bosses. All the news editors were obsessed with rave culture and its tribes of nonconformists. But every Friday night, the word with Terry and with um, Katie felt like a space which challenged that old way of seeing things. They were at the heart of that show. Terry obviously presented the whole run. Katie joined in series two, and we'll talk a bit about that. You can read plenty about the history of the programme online. There are some amazing clips on YouTube. They've helped choose some really interesting ones um, with the story behind them. Um, so do go and um, look at more. We could only show you so much. Um, I should say the programme was full of amazing live music by new bands. A friend of mine who's a BBC secretary told me one, one Thursday, I'm going to be on The Word tomorrow. And her sister was the lead singer of the Voodoo Queens and had taught her the two or three chords because she couldn't play. And there she was on your show. <laughs> so that sense of anyone could be on The Word for all kinds of reasons um, was really valuable about the time. Um, we're going to talk about the on location films, which exposed the weirdness, particularly the USA. You'll see all the influences into modern reality television and so much that we take for granted that the word pioneered. And I still think so much of it looks so fresh and so dangerous in the right way. Um, a sense of it being a programme that people loved to watch and wondered what might happen. Um, Terry, of course, had come from the music scene as a DJ, a, a well-known broadcaster and presenter. Katie Puckrick had originally come um, as a dancer. who would finished touring with the Pet Shop Boys, and her audition process was kind of part of, of word programming as well. But I wanted to start um, by just asking both of you what it felt like when you took on that programme and what you felt you were, you were doing there. <laughs> Terry first. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it was a really unusual circumstance for me because, uh, you know, I'd worked on the radio from 1982 and even won a couple of Sony Radio Awards, especially its music show, and, and then I ended up uh, in Manchester uh, on the second biggest commercial station in Britain with my own show, three hours a night, six till nine o'clock, and two till five on a Sunday afternoon, and 100% free choice in what I played. And so it, it coincided with a lot of bands that, that had been around in Manchester for four, five, six years, sort of being around, and I was playing them, you know, so it even got to the stage that by the time the Stone Roses album came out, which was like April, May 89, I was playing like three tracks by the Stone Roses every night on that show. And then when I, when I, when I kind of was at the radio, I also got a, a job at the Manchester Evening News writing about the up-and-coming bands in Manchester, and that page was called The Word Page. Mm. So when I suddenly got offered an audition for this TV show, and this would have been maybe November or December of 1989, they didn't know what the show was going to be called, they didn't know what the show format was going to be, and it was just some guy had got my name from somewhere, rang me up, it was Matthew Bowles, oh, you I remember think, him? And yeah. he, he went, oh, hi, uh, would you would like to be auditioned for this TV show? And <laughs> I was like, well... That's what he sounds I, like, too. I, I was in my mum and dad's... Yeah, it was like Leslie Phillips, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I, I was in my mum and dad's council house, and it was like... You know, stay, you know, because I hadn't, I hadn't sorted myself anywhere out to live. I'd just moved up to, back to Manchester from Derby. And uh, I just thought, what's the point with an accent like mine hmm. going on national telly? And also, I was quite shy. And I, I just said, will you pay me train fare? And he <laughs> said... Cheap date. And, and he said, no. And I said, well, forget it. <laughs> I, I, but I wasn't trying to be cool. That was the level of self-belief I had. <laughs> you know... As long as I get me bus fare, I'll go. Anyway, 20 minutes later, he rang me back and said, oh, said OK, we'll pay your train fare. So I felt like I was roped into it then. And I uh, went down, and for whatever reason, they then invited me to Cliveden. There was a meeting there about what this show would be. And I hadn't even been given the show yet. And then there was the official auditions in uh, January when all London's bright young things were auditioned, you know. In, I mean... Davina McCall, uh, Karen Keating, um, oh, what's it, Jez Nelson. Because um, it's really significant that it yeah, was Yeah, uh, Rob, Rob Newman, uh, everybody. And, that's, and, and so not, that's funny because they brought, they wheeled those guys back in. And they all hated me as if I'd taken something off them. 
Yeah, oh yeah, Dominic Diamond and people like that. So a few of them all made made a, a return visit. Yeah, Davina McCall and Jess Nelson. Yeah, yeah. They were just like, 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 yeah. Well, well I, I think there were personal reasons between Charlie and Davina why she didn't get given the job in the first place, and they ended up giving it to Amanda. But Amanda Roger didn't Cadenet. get Amanda Amanda de Cabernet didn't get the job until about three weeks before we went we'll on talk air. Talk a bit more about the presenters and. So yeah, yeah. So so it, so it was odd, and and it was only because I wasn't I wasn't really earning that much money. It was mm. I'd, I'd just finished with. Key 103, mm -hmm. because they got rid of me because they thought I was playing too much obscure music, i.e. the Stone Roses. As I said in the evening news at the time, Shakespeare's obscure if you're illiterate. <laughs> and, then, and, then I was and then I was doing a show late night on KFM with a guy who'd just been sacked as the manager of a Manchester band called The Man From Del Monte, which is John Ronson. Whatever happened to him? So we know, we know just how Creepy rich your hinterland git. was. I want to bring in Katie, because although we'll talk a bit more about your audition process, just when you did join the programme, just remind us what world you felt you were entering. I just finished touring with the Pet Shop Boys, which was the coolest job that I ever had until I got the word job. And um, I was thinking, what am I going to do now? How am I going to top this? I can't go back to manpower working as an office temp. Um, and I, was, I actually was signing on, so I was getting my unemployment. And I was thinking, you know, how am I going to surf this thing out? And a friend of mine uh, called me, who American friend of mine lived in Manchester. She said, there's this TV show. They're looking. They have an ad out. They're looking for somebody. They don't have to have any TV experience. And I thought, sure, I'll, uh, that, that's me. I'll, I'll try it out. And um, the contrast from uh, the work contrast actually wasn't that different to what I was used to doing because I was used to being a show off. I was used to uh, exhibiting myself on stage in various lurid uh, permutations. And I also worked as, as a singer. I was trying to, I thought, you know, I was going to give Madonna a run for her money at some stage. So I definitely was uh, uh, up and running in terms of being a show poodle. But to have that platform, which I think is what you're, you're getting at, like to suddenly be, like overnight, people knew how to say my weird, unpronounceable surname. <laughs> so I had people yelling Katie Puckrick at me and then going, you're short. That was, all, that was like a, a, a recurring theme. But um, it, it was uh, weirdly relaxing for me to be on this show because I think I'd been struggling so hard to get a toehold into show business. So I, there was an element of like, ah, but also, it was really unrelaxing because um, there's always the static of being recognized wherever you go and also being ex expected to perform. But in terms of understanding the cultural significance of being on the show, there's no way you could have a sense of that until hindsight kicked well, in. I want to show you some clips now. And just before I do, one of the key things is very quickly the word became a show which was always making headlines. Yeah. Tabloids especially loved it. I mean, you were tweeting this week about, you know, bl blame the word for yeah. the moral turpitude. And that was definitely happening. They hated it. That's they, what you mean. They hated it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was like my news editors. They were obsessed with what were these young people doing and it seemed incredibly <laughs> depraved to them. Absolutely lovely clips. And if we start with the last one first, there are so many little things in there about why you chose to show the Eddie Murphy clip, how sh relaxed she is with you, how it feels mm. like a genuine... How terrified I am. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about... Because obviously you chose the Eddie Murphy thing to show deliberately. Well, well I, what it was is she was supposed to be going out with Eddie Murphy at the time. That was what she was. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the very first show of the word that was on at 11 o'clock at night. So that was the 12th show. And you've got to remember, I'd done no TV. So that was the 12th live show. And then you've got her on. I'd met Boy George before, but I was absolutely terrified. And she was this massive star. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the embarrassment was palpable because you, I just felt like a dick all the time. You know? And yet when I look back now, so even though, you know, mm. beautiful, radiant, glowing, and she looked quite good as well. <laughs> it was like, um, it, 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 was, it, it was kind of different. What, 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 what was funny, uh, you know, it, that, there's quite a lot of that interview used in the Nick Broomfield uh, documentary, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it makes his film in a way. <laughs> I get more time in that than Rita Franklin. Um, you know, you know so, so yeah, I mean, it was special because she was probably the biggest guest that we'd had on at that time. And you've got so many big guests. And Katie, I was thinking that's partly this time in television. It's long before PR's got super wise. Well, they, wasn't it? it's before so it, controlling PR, access. Yes, yeah, before they got super wise to the word, uh, for sure. Because uh, we got a lot of American stars who came on the show and they had no idea what they were walking into. So the fact that it was a, a live studio audience and anything could happen, I mean, uh, you know, we responded to the moment and we ping-ponged off of uh, 
spontaneous stuff that arose in the studio. And uh, once they were out of the clutches of their PR, bodyguards and babysitters, we could ask them anything, so. I mean, I mean, we did go off script, so we even totally. asked her about if she was in a film. There's nothing prepared for that. Yeah. And there's a scoop there. You know, I mean, yeah, there's well, it was just looking at you, thought, well, she, you know, she looked like a movie star, so right. you kind of, it was a natural question to ask. So sometimes you would unearth gold because you were going off the usual questions. Other times it could be quite painful. Oh, totally. Well, you know, Let's however, it was hard for you to tell because we just, Candled it all so well, didn't we? Oh, yeah, yes. Well, that's why. let's talk about the Oliver Reed example because it's it's much remembered. I think it's partly misremembered. And when you watch even just that short extract, you can see how he's not. He's very much in control. He's not. Yeah, so it's a very interesting thing. Is that the only clip that we have that we're showing of? It's Oliver? the only clip of Oliver um, Reed. Yeah. So um, we both have conflicting feelings ab about this event, but. Mm. Um, once, uh, I mean, the, the setup was that, hey, let's get Ollie Reed, a famous drunk, and um, lock him in his dressing room with a couple of cases of vodka. And a hidden camera. And a hidden camera, let the fun begin. And we hired um, Paul Kay, who later made a name for himself as Dennis Pennis, to play this geeky producer who would come Very in. Very camp, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just come in and kind of uh, fluff his feathers and, you know, just be disruptive generally and um, get him, get Oliver Reed riled up. So I was the one kind of like narrating this thing and, you know, hunting the game, so to speak. And what you saw there was us desperately trying to wrap him up because it was the end of the show and we had our ear, you know, the, the instructions in our earpieces that, you know, we were gonna go to the, the credits, the end credits any second. So that's why I'm desperately going, please sing, please sing. <laughs> Um, but it was an interesting thing because uh, he had a lot to drink, and in fact, um, the Anna, the makeup artist, told me recently that her assistant uh, had been prevailed upon by him to give up her 4711 cologne that she had in her bag, and he drank that as well. Um, and I don't know whether that was some kind of punk rock stunt, because obviously he already had the cases of, uh, of vodka and beer and everything else, but you know, he was drinking, but he was, weirdly playing us as well and you can see you know that he is yeah. kind of in command of the situation and he was also flirting with me a little bit not there but uh, earlier he wasn't the only one yeah well I, I, quite, I kind of enjoyed it because you know I'm a cheap date and I'll take what I can get <laughs> I mean I actually heard that he that he was pretending to be drunk and uh, my issue with it at the time was we hadn't had any great guests on that that series and that night we had him and Bill Hicks on. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, Bill Hicks was jet lagged because he came straight off of the flight from LA right. into the studios when we were in Limehouse at the time. And Ollie Reed, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, was there anything that unusual about having Ollie Reed drunk on a TV show at the time? You know, we were probably fourth or fifth, yeah. the fifth one that he'd been on. For sure. And, you know, he, he was, you know, to me, he was one of the great British actors. And I thought, well, why waste him doing that with him? Mm. Why not just interview the guy? and? You know, so I, I had quite a lot of arguments with Paul Ross in the in the time running up to that. Who was you know, a yeah, yeah, he was a he was a series producer because I just thought it was a waste of a good guest because really, you know, it's like, you know, for me, you know, it was a bit triggering, you know, because you know, my my dad was, you know, had, had a strange relationship with alcohol, let's say. So mm -hmm. to have that kind of, I, I just don't didn't think it was that funny. It's a bit like George Best, you know, it, it, you know, we were supposed to have him on the word when we were on at six o'clock. And uh, because our boss, Charlie, knew nothing about football, he didn't really know who George Best was, turned him down as a guest, and then was gutted when he went on Terry Wogan, <laughs> drunk. And he was going, oh, gosh, we should have booked him, you know? <laughs> you know put a drunkard on in front of lots of it, teams it is, at 6 o'clock on a Friday night. It's definitely like bear baiting, isn't it? I mean, that was yeah. a lot of... Well, well I, I, I can't... Which now I think there'd be more... I mean, I just wonder if it's less likely you could do that now. I just thought there was a sneer factor to mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and that's what I didn't like. So it felt like it was punching down. And I, I just thought he would have been a much more interesting guest. He would have still had a drink, but yeah. I, I thought he was pretending to be drunk. Yeah, that, that was the thing is I, I definitely felt uneasy because I was in charge of bringing him up from his dressing room and going, hey, guess what? Like it, announcing that there was this big surprise and, you know, look, here's the monitor and we were spying on you. And he his whole demeanor was very like, oh, what a surprise. Well, it, and it I'm was so what it, shocked. I mean, there was, a, I, there was a lot of that I felt on Channel 4. The Big Breakfast was famous for it, too, where mm -hmm. you get something that was funny for about 10 seconds, <laughs> but the joke would be dragged out for about half an hour. So now in retrospect, because everyone talks about it a lot, 
it, but the actual thing, it fell slightly flat. I well, thought, at I, the time. I, I think people feel. I mean, it's uncomfortable watching, um, and maybe that's one of the reasons it, it still it attracts. It has viewers. a free song. It has a free that. song. Mm -hmm. um, there was the Jeremy Clarkson one as well. I mean, I was thinking actually that by sheer coincidence, the three you've chosen, you know, um, two of them are dead and one of them um, kind of got sacked from the BBC for hitting somebody. So it's kind of some kind of well, career death. Yeah, um, cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is interesting, the, the sort of the gay terror in his eyes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a bit, a bit unfair of me, but, but it was, it's interesting how his shtick hasn't changed, isn't it? Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, he, he would be saying exactly the same thing yeah. now. You heard him and, made that comment about his and not fa and, and, in fact, me, and in fact, many, many fans of his would uh, still kind of applaud what he said, mm. you know, even now. The one other thing I just wanted to mention briefly, and we haven't got a clip, but it's one of my personal favourites, is the whole mashup when you had Snoop Dogg and Rod Hull and Emu. <laughs> And, and it was, and I remember I did talk to Charlie Parsons who said that there was a thing about that point where you had all these new stars and actually then these old variety stars who'd kind of lost their television coverage and he thought there was a kind of value in putting them together. It was certainly striking television. How did you both feel about those kind of stunt pairings? I've never seen that to this day. Because I, I was I, I was in Ireland, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be interested in watching it, you know. Well, then it turned out Snoop Dogg is a huge fan of Benny Hill. Oh, and, yeah. And there's a photo of him doing the, well, the salute. Well, Benny Hill, I mean, all the kind of uh, the blue collar. Yeah, American. America, Americans. Yeah, so so mainly, mainly yeah. because it, when I was on Celebrity Big Brother with uh, Latoya Jackson, all the Jackson yeah. family used to love Benny Hill. All the, all the black Americans especially loved the Benny there, Hill show. Yeah, there's like some weird stuff like, um, uh, what's the... Um, Monty Python guy that did the show about the um, the B and B. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, and and Benny Hill, and then um, yeah, there's just like some random flotsam and jetsam from British culture, or <laughs> actually specifically English culture, that gets over to America. But um, for me, as an American, I mean, I came over here in the '80s, and it, it, this. The, what was considered culture in, you know, the 80s were really no different from the 1950s. It was like the Festival of Britain had just uh, overextended itself and it didn't really change. Uh, British culture didn't change until Thatcher got in and then the 90s and the 2000s happened and it became much more globalized. But before then it was really kind of rigidly stuck in this weird, like you turn on Radio 1 and you would hear the Wombles and then you would hear something really cool. You'd hear like kitty stuff and the Wombles and then a country <laughs> song and it was just really weird. So that, your question about, you know, Snoop Dogg and Emu together, to me felt very British. So it felt like that was totally in keeping. Well, well, well that was something we tried to do on the show anyway. Yeah. It was that to have those sort of, a bit like Top of the Pops in the old days. Yeah, where you would exactly have, that. You would have you know, like the birdie song gone at the same time. Yeah, as a novelty sex number. Yeah, yeah. It, so so it was like the troughs all, and peaks. The, the, you know, stuff that grandma was into and stuff that the kids <laughs> were into, and the stuff that the cool, you know, foldy art armed moody teens were into. Um, Basil Fawlty, Fawlty Towers, that's what I was trying to think of, oh. TV show. Um, so that we watch a lot of that in America. But yeah, so that's what, okay. the word felt like that. It felt like, you know, it was so camp, because my God. Uh, but knowingly camp, which was a very 90s thing. 90s yeah, thing well, well, you know, we, we can really get into that, but the word was so much a part of the 90s, because the 90s was w when irony became the language of, of everything. So mm -hmm. it was, everything was about detached humor. You couldn't feel earnest or invested in anything. You couldn't reveal that you cared about anything. So the word, as you said, that sneery thing, that was very well, much well, a part well, of it. I, I, I thought that came from, you know, because a lot of our producers are very public school. So that's <laughs> their idea. Here we of, go. Class well, well, warfare well, well, begins well, here. Well, that, that's a reality of it, you know, because <laughs> because that that was a kind of schizophrenia with it within the show. Yeah. But really, we set out to make a show, you know, from, from the beginning. That was basically bringing a night out into your living room yeah. if you were 15 or 16 mm -hmm. and you couldn't quite go out. So you'd have the highs, the lows, the madness. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea of it. It wasn't to, I mean, praxis, we can, you know, you do something and you work out why you did it later. But but really, with, with the word, it was to reflect that. And you've got to remember, you know, you talk about the 80s and the 90s and that Thatcher era. Young people had no money. Most mm -hmm. of them had no jobs mm -hmm. outside of London. So it was very much a, a time where... It was a, still that do-it-yourself, slightly punk thing going on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of hedonism, a lot of live for the moment, you know, that instant gratification thing. There was a lot of that in the 90s. You're never going to have a job. You're going to be disappointed if you've got long-term plans. But in the short term, you can have a great time. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's what we tried to reflect without being overly cool. Well, the other thing about the word was that it was... 
kind of hard to believe now, but glamorous, you know, so there was an element of, you know, going yes. out to a nightclub and, and seeing like, you know, Whitney Houston, oh my God, or <laughs> Snoop Dogg, you know, these really amazing people. So there was an element of glamour. To well, them down to our level, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> now, and I want to talk a bit more about the look of it. What I want to show next, though, we've got a great set of clips of Katie, um, partly just mm -hmm. clipped from different shows, but also your audition process. And after that, I'd be quite keen to talk about the whole kind of presenter relationships and the class thing a bit more. Let's have a look. I remember asking you about being on this program, and you said you think that what partly as being American meant that people couldn't work out if you were being serious or not. Yes. And that really comes across in those clips. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I didn't know if I was being serious or not. <laughs> so it was kind of a helpful little uh, force field to shield me from the ugly reality of life. Um, the, the interesting thing about the word was, uh, you know, from cooking it up in the writer's room, you know, the producer's meeting, to uh, getting in the field and actually creating these uh, events that we did or these live events or pre-recorded things, um, there was a certain alchemy that would happen. So there would be an element of like how the producers envisaged it and then by the time you got there and were meeting the person and having your little instant relationship with them, um, something else might occur. So um, sometimes things were devised, as, as Terry would say, a little sneery or like this is going to be funny or maybe humiliating and mocking and ironic and all these sort of 90s things. And then I'd get out and meet the person and it would turn into something quite beautiful and wholesome and real. And um, but because people watching the word thought, hey, we're gonna, we're, we're like uh, hunkering down for this, uh, this funny little, uh, you know, little bit of, uh, um, you know, we're laughing up our sleeves at somebody. They sort of, they came into, viewers would come into the uh, watch it with a certain expectation, but the expectation would be twisted by what they actually saw. So I think it was a little confusing. Can I ask about class? Because Charlie Parsons said to me when I was interviewing him about the show, he said he was going for an, a 1960s vibe like and a class thing. So his, his comparison was Michael Caine and Princess Margaret. And I'm guessing that this, you were Michael Caine and Amanda de Cadene was Princess Margaret. What do you make Only of Only I do a better thing? northern accent than Michael Caine and get carded on. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you have felt that class was part of how the programme um, was run in terms of who I, was I, in I think I think it was just talk, talk, TV, TV and the media anyway. I mean, I'd worked to, on radio, and I'd, I'd actually even done two years of a show on Radio 4 called WPFM, which is like aimed at fifth and sixth formers. This was from 86 to 88. And, um, that, I mean, it was massive, you know, because I'd worked with people who'd always done stuff. So from my radio shows came Henry Normal, who now runs Baby Cow with uh, Steve Coogan, mm -hmm. uh, Lem Cisse, he was my resident poet as well then on, uh, you know, Key 103, uh, you know, John Ronson I'd worked with, uh, people that I worked with on, you know, on the radio in Derby, they, they'd end up, ended up like producers, directors, editors. Um, I, funny enough, the, the girl that, that I was trying to get auditioned for series two of The Word, and they wouldn't audition her because she was from Manchester, and when Katie got the job, was Carolina Hearn. Mm. Whatever happened to her? Mm. But it was <laughs> so, quite so, interesting, not two people. So, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but, then, but then suddenly you, you, you're into this milieu of working in national television, and it wasn't that they were all bad, but it was like they were all uber posh and had very little in their CVs. That meant that, you know, kind of, why are you working here? And I, and I knew that I was the one that didn't belong even though you would have thought, you know, with eight years of experience and, you know, National Sony Awards on my CV and being part of a music scene, having managed, you know, bands, I managed a reggae mm. band, I got, you know, signed to a major deal back in the mid-80s, to go into that and then not be listened to because yeah. you were there as, like, almost like the comedy turn. And it, and it was, it, it, it was quite amusing, but it was also hard to take, you know, especially when you're from that background, when you, you felt slightly worthless anyway, you know, because, well, you know, I, I grew up in a big family where, you know, I spent most of my childhood on, you know, free school dinners, you know, dad in and out of work, you know, it, you know, panicking if there was a strike, you know, the three day week. I remember that, you know, when I was like 14 and suddenly I had to go back on free school dinners after the six months of escaping that humiliation. But here you were now, this huge star. Um, however, 
complicated the reality of how you felt you were treated by the team. But also, and we hinted at it earlier on... It, it, it's it was, how I felt inside. Yeah. It wasn't even about how you were treated by them. But because was it, it wasn't them, it was me. But it was also how you and the other presenters were treated by the, the sort of tabloid press in particular, who seemed to really take against the show. And they seemed to take against you personally, I think it's fair to say. Some of them did. Yeah. Um, what was your feeling, I mean, make Katie first, about the moral um, sort of aggro that came... Well, no everything that Terry just discussed w went completely over my head because as an American, I didn't have a perception of uh, class or, I mean, I, had I understood that there, you know, people had different funny accents. <laughs> and um, so I, I didn't feel like I was at a disadvantage or an advantage. I just felt like I was outside the system, so it didn't really matter. Um, and in terms of perception well that you know the kind of stories that are running in the papers complaining about yeah the I just felt like depraved. I felt like we were all in the same business you know I, I didn't I didn't take it seriously like I didn't feel like uh, I needed to worry about it. I felt like oh good you know like people are watching the show yeah. like I was I'd been around the block a few times to know that um, that you know any press was great press they weren't really saying it was morally depraved when well, the two, the two series like. when Kate, that was more when yeah. Paul Ross was the editor and then uh, Duncan well, Gray took over. The, and then it was morally depraved. It, I, I will say that um, my perception, and I could be biased, but the two se seasons I did, which was, were two and three, yeah. still, they, they seemed to be when the word hit its stride and, there, and we hadn't alienated all the PR people yet. Well, so well, we still had it, quite a lot of glamour. It, well, and, well, it was good, and we got good guests. Yeah. We had good bands. I mean, what was interesting was watching Take That, because they were promised, if they did that, because we're still fairly unknown, yeah. if, they, if they did that, they would then appear on series two of The Word, and they wouldn't have them on. Oh, no. Joe Wiley wouldn't book them. Oh, oh that's right. Joe Wiley was the music and, and, and So, time, so yeah. her, her and Sebastian Scott, both, and I kept saying, get that band from Manchester on. They're doing yeah. really well. Yeah. And the irony was, the following year when they'd gone big, yeah. they wouldn't do the word because yeah, we'd snubbed them. Of course. But they were doing the big breakfast that had Sebastian Scott then as the editor. Yeah. You thought that you're blaming the wrong people. Exactly. And um, there were a few other presenters who came through the show. And I remember was it season three or four when Hufty. Um, the lesbian presenter was on. Yeah, yeah. She, came, um, she was my replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how, uh, you know, I don't know how far you've spoken to her since, but I, I sometimes wonder what people who worked on the programme as presenters felt about the way that you you were maybe being positioned. And certainly looking at Hufty, on the one hand, it felt that the programme was very serious about challenging homophobia at a time when mainstream politicians were still incredibly anti-gay. But on the other hand, was there a stunt element yeah, of Yeah, like st a stunt element but you worked with her so well I, I mean the, the weird thing about Hufty was she was just one of the blokes so I had someone to talk about football with because mm -hmm. she was a big Newcastle United fan and what she didn't want to be was a lesbian spokeswoman yeah, you right. know she was just somebody who, who happened like the to token. Yeah, that, yeah that she happened to fancy women rather than blokes yeah. but it was like she wasn't making any big statement you know she was like me she was a recovering Catholic mm -hmm. she you know she drank too much you know, smoked too much mm. and fancied women. In fact, she was just like me. <laughs> Except I supported a better football team. Now, I know that so often you were on location, and we're going to talk about on location mm. next, but I'm really struck by the fact, Terry, that you and Katie um, still have this really natural warmth about you. Um, what was it that... <laughs> <laughs> well, given that we know that there were different kinds of tensions with different presenters on that show, <laughs> what was the secret to the fact that your friendship seems genuine? I don't think we, we were ever mates. I think I actually admired her because she had all that self-belief and oomph, oomph that I never had. Oomph. But then, but then, but then at the same time, I, I thought she was interesting, but I never thought, I never assumed that anyone would like me. I was too much of an alien, you know, to the whole process. Here's what I remember about you, Terry. So um, we, when we worked together, we would really only see each other yeah, yeah. Thursday nights when we had a, a drive from the office in to do our oh, to voice, do, yeah, voiceovers. voiceover and it took an hour in, in rush hour traffic so we had to go from the Isle of Dogs and drive all the way into to Soho and then you would regale me with um, <laughs> his, the history of the monarchy in Britain and you would talk about the royal family and how they were related to Germans and um, all yeah. Germans they are yeah. German yeah yeah so you're very <laughs> heated about that and so, I, so I learned about that a lot and then I also learned a lot about class warfare from you as well but um so 
And that was all fine, but I never <laughs> thought that you paid any attention to me. Like, I didn't know that you were interested in me at all or cared about me. I, 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 no, but I'm so used to kind of being the fourth or six kids. I was so put upon, and the fact that I suddenly get to speak, and it's like, so, oh, oh my, it's all bottled up in there, you know. <laughs> I'll be crying in a minute. So, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing some really wholesome counselling here. You are, you are doing some wholesome counselling. <laughs> I mean, I was no good at, you know, I mean, I, and, I, and I'm still not, you know, because I had a lot of... Uh, I've still got issues, you know, about about loads of stuff. But really? the, the horrible thing about me <laughs> <laughs> is if I didn't like someone, I wouldn't talk to them. Yeah. No, I mean, it's the, we obviously knew, could you know, without getting in too deeply, that we were both in the trenches together. Yeah. Muppets, that, weren't we? And we, you know, both were smart and we knew what was what. So and it was and also it was kind of survival of the fittest mm -hmm. and you needed an ally rather than another enemy in a situation mm. like that. That's really well put. A really significant part of the show, and clearly part of the big budget that went into the word, were the on-location reports. They were often edited very short, so they, you know, but it was clear that they were the result of days of filming on location. Um, and I was really struck watching some of these, that there was more to them than the Euro trash equivalent films, which oh, were played yeah. very strongly for laughs with kind of mm. jokey, you know, um, voiceovers and so hey, on. Hey, big budget. <laughs> Shotgun motel, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And well, begging for an upgrade. Yeah, well, <laughs> it looked it looked like you went and travelled a lot. Oh, that's because all the money was spent on screen. Well, <laughs> Half yeah. the budget of yeah. uh, TFI. Really? Mm. Well, let's have a look. We've got a few um, clips of on-location reports and we'll talk yeah, after. And for what it's worth, I interviewed Jeff Coos quite recently and he was so boring. Oh, was he? And so I thought that was a much more interesting... That was his interview. flashiest uh, time. Yeah, so Jeff Coons, famous artist, um, he married his art project, Chicholina. Um, all of his sculptures and um, photographs that he did with her were, were, were of them having sex in, in very kind of grand settings. And um, I'll have you know that before cameras, that was a live interview, and before the cameras started rolling, he definitely slipped out of his man pants. Oh, no. And uh, yeah, so he was all in the buff there. So that's that's why I was a little kind of like tweaked out. You should, when have, I was grabbed, you should <laughs> have grabbed it quick. Yeah, no, there was no g grabbing going Ooh. on. Yeah. The, the one that you did with that child preacher, um, that was child abuse, wasn't it? Well, it was tell me how, how you felt making it, and also what you did because you took him off, didn't you? Well, well, we spent spent two days spent two days with him, and then um, then I was the one who took him off to play video games because he wasn't allowed to do anything. That kid, you know, he was, he was only just twelve, and uh, you know he, he hadn't been eating properly, all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, what was interesting was cousin Leroy was actually Boo Radley. Seriously, he was like a big guy, and he was <laughs> right. like we had to give him a lift, you know, to the thing. And cousin Leroy went like this: was he said, "Is it October in England now, too?" <laughs> and we went, yeah. And he said, so y'all have the same calendar as we do? <laughs> said, uh, yeah, you know, Gregorian calendar, 16th century, whatever. He went, he went the Jews have a different calendar. Uh, and we're like, okay, <laughs> good, yeah. there was help. A, there was a sense of real, uh, not quite danger, but with the Scientologists, mm. I mean, there was a real uncovering of some... Stuff which you know you're waiting till going clear. Alex Gibney's documentary to see yeah. that stuff exposed again. Properly. Yeah, it, we didn't see it in that clip there, but um, that that man I was talking to, I, I was kind of playing around with them, and I was saying, well, what kinds of questions uh, would you be asking somebody when you were giving auditing them? Basically, you're getting emotional blackmail material on people that you can hold against them when they start acting up and want to leave the church later. And so I was kind of just goofing around and and asking. Um, increasingly i was asking questions quite aggressively and going you know uh, you know do you do you drink milk straight out of the carton have you ever kissed a dog and i you know it's just sort of yelling these things out and then he started to get really unnerved and he said actually those are the kind of questions that that we would ask um but as we were filming this thing we were outside the scientology celebrity center which is in hollywood and that's where they bring your tom cruises and your your john travolta's and the like and uh we were just out on the pavement right in front public uh you know public turf and uh i was shooting my opening piece to camera and somebody in their 
blue Scientology uniform came over and accosted us and said, you can't be filming out here. Why? Why can't we be filming out here? This is public right of way. Well, you just have to move on. And it's really creepy because they are, they do have this like scary authority. Well, but you grew up Catholic as well, didn't you? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I mean, our only sex education at school was swerving the pedo priest. <laughs> so Scientology would hold no fears for yeah, us. Yeah, no fears, no. That's an upgrade. Yes, well, no, it's, it's certainly part of the occult. <laughs> We're all going to hell. Did you ever feel um, in a situation where you thought, I don't feel we can film this? I mean, you talked about, the, you know, there's, there's a sense of this child is, is you know... It, is abused in the, in, the, in the environment he's in, but you can't really change that. No, no, there no, other situations you, where you felt, I need to intervene or I need to say no the, to something? The, the, the one for me, and they never used it, was uh, when they would they'd do anything on fat liberation. And this was, again, this would have been for Series 5. Mm. And uh, so there was, like, this big big thing in America, you know, because obviously America, there's a lot of uh, problems with obesity. And, you know, they even put sugar in the milk, don't they? You know, so it's a diet that's mm. pushed at them. So obviously people are going to be obese. And... They, they actually had a group over there who were trying to get, you know, so that they didn't have to pay for extra airline seats and that there was space for them and all, all of this, which were all quite reasonable things. But all the word wanted to do was arrange this convention where we could see them all wobbling about <laughs> to, like, you know, the latest rave track at their at their convention party. And then film so, them in slow motion. Yeah, yeah. So, so we ended up in, uh, I think it was Grand Rapids, Michigan, or some, you know, some hellhole like that. You know, it was like an above-the-ground cemetery this place and <laughs> and it was and and what happened was they then wanted us to film something else in LA so could we move their party a day forward mm. and the guys that I was there with who were working on the word were trying and I said don't even go there because they will see right through this and well you know could we just get a few balloons you know and uh, give them a few balloons and get them and this was all the instructions coming back you yeah. know from the office as if they were stupid mm. um I can even remember doing uh, John Wayne Bobbitt as well, and it was like, oh, you know, it, I mean, it was it was just horrible. You know, I everything ha- about it was mm. kind of horrible, really. I have um, a couple of stories about this. So uh, one was I had an item where I had to go talk to, um, I'm already laughing, uh, sex addicts. It's hilarious. And uh, so, of course, before we knew as much as we now know about sex uh, ad- addiction, it did just seem like, well, that can't be a real thing. That just <laughs> sounds like an excuse to have fun all the time. And uh, so... Uh, my fun afternoon was going around and talking to couples who were obviously like trying to patch up their broken relationships. The man invariably was the one with this addiction. And, um, the, I, I always remember the, um, the camera crew going around and getting B roll of like boxes of tissue and things like that to cut in. And, um, so I spent an afternoon chatting to, to various, uh, addicted people and, uh, went back to the hotel in West Hollywood. I don't know if you remember that place that we would stay. And, um, apartments, weren't they? Yeah, they were, they were bigger than where I lived in London. And, um, so I went back to my room and I guess I was just like, my producer Tammy remembers this that um, apparently I was uh, stretching out doing some yoga stretches and I happened to look out the window and there was one of the sex <laughs> addicts in a tree looking into my <laughs> into my hotel room not a good chat up line that no. is it and so I, I called down to reception and, and the producer was down there like uh you know Bob uh from the shoot <laughs> is uh about to shoot uh <laughs> and uh we got him out of the tree and he was just he couldn't have been more apologetic but you know <laughs> Needs are needs, and um, by the way, he did have the call sheet, and he saw where we lived, so that was fine. But um, in answer, actually, more to your question, um, there was an item where, um, you know, we got a lot of material. The producers would comb the headlines, and there was some story about a woman who'd been in a coma for, oh, I don't know, a generation, like 25 years she'd been in a coma, and in the meantime, her child, her little girl had grown up, and her husband was still there by her side, and she'd come out of the coma, and it was an amazing thing, so we were off to Florida to meet the woman who was a zombie, as it said in the headline. Like, and so the uh, producer is very concerned that I get the daughter to say, my mother was a zombie, um, because that would be just a hilarious bit of a soundbite to have. But the thing is, it's like on paper, sure, that's all very well and good, but you go there and you find out there's a family that is reunited mm-hmm. because the mother has virtually come back from the dead like a zombie. And um, so I'm talking to the daughter uh, who's now 
whatever, a grown woman in, in her 40s and her elderly mother, who actually, truth be told, was slipping back into a coma by then. So it was a little bit of a short-term awakening. So I'm chatting to the daughter and I'm saying, what must, what was it, what's it like to have your mother back? And, you know, tell me about it. And she's welling up and I'm crying as well. And we're just having this connection. And I can see over her shoulder, Martin Cunning, the producer going, zombie. <laughs> Get, get her to say zombie. And so that's one of those things where you just feel like this is really mm. degraded and terrible and bad. And Martin Cunning was one of the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, well, I mean, I remember having to do the penis extension operation yes. in Florida, and that it was just like heartbreaking. A, it looked like a stuck pig. The that copper thing. with a little chopper and all yeah. that kind of stuff, and he's just like, oh my God. And they even did a separate shot of me where, where, where the doctor had to say how what was the smallest you know, erection he'd ever seen, and I had to do this face going like that. <laughs> Stop it. Stop making me do this. It's a living. I'll go to hell. Yeah. Well, thank you for confessing all this. I feel it's yeah. cathartic. <laughs> we have one more set of clips to show and a bit more chat, and then we'll take questions. And this is about the music. Um, what's really memorable about the word, one of the many memorable things, is the bands who came on, who came on very early in their careers, and the amazing way this show shot pop music. When you think all you had to compete with it was Top of the Pops. Yeah. And the odd appearance on a on a chat show, like kind of Terry Wilder. Or a morning, like a kid's morning show. Or a show. kid's morning show. Saturday morning show. Um, and I think from talking to one of the producers, I gather there were three performances, two live yeah. bands and a one which would be... Oh, no, it was three time. live ones towards, and yes. even four towards the end. Yeah. And watch out for the sets with the chroma key, which I still think look really fresh. That was Tim Burke who came up with that idea. And then he got... Uh, we, we did a great interview with James Brown in a uh, thingy. And then as soon as, as soon as he got, he got sacked before the show even went on air... <sighs> Hey, we don't want him stealing the credit. <laughs> yeah. So what we've got to show you is first, I think, is uh, you on location with the Happy Mondays, and then you'll see some of the bands who got their TV this is before debuts. We, this is before we went on air, this. So this is the summer of 1990, yeah. so when these, they were recording their band debut debuts, album. The music holds up. Occasional cutaways to some of those audience haircuts are what date it. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about the music and how important it was, because I know you really cared passionately. Well, well that, was, that was the background that, that I'd come from. And then the idea of the word, you know, even when we were chatting about it before it started, was that it had to have that kind of inclusiveness of, like, the Hitman and Her and also Top of the Pops, you know, the old Top of the Pops. And then also, you know, So It Goes, you know, Tony Wilson, Granada TV, that introduced those new bands. So... In every show, the, the real idea was to get something credible on, something pop on, and then always a black artist, purely on skin colour, brown skin. And, th and that's... Be well, well, no, but, but that was the whole thing, because, you know, when I grew up, you know, the area I grew up in, you're either Irish descent or Jamaican. And what I remember about being around, you know, kids' houses, and we'd be... You were never allowed in the actual living room or anything. You'd be playing in the hallway, you know, like football cards or whatever. But the minute anyone black appeared okay. in a TV show in those days, everyone would get shouted into the living room, you know, even, well, the, the, the parlour, as they call it, and you'd go in there and it'd be like Kenny Lynch, you know, or sometimes yeah. it'd be, oh, false alarm, it's a black and white minstrel show. <laughs> but it, but so, so it was to give that inclusivity, but then also, you know, to get good bands on, because in the first series of The Word, our music booker was um, a guy who ended up managing Steps. So... He used, and you know, I mean, it's like with Oasis. I spent six weeks arguing the toss to get them on, and that's because my ex and the mother of my kids was their plugger. And you know, you know, because she looked after the Inspiral mm. carpets from Manchester, and you know, Noel had been. So I got mired anyway, and then in turn mired the people. But it was like it was that thing you could you could see the production line coming through music wise, and that was what I'd always done. You know, my one talent was for spotting talent in that way but in series one it was really hard because this guy used to lie you know you'd say you wanted a band on like the manic street preachers doing motown junk and he'd say uh, well they're not available this week and then i'd yeah. find out via my girlfriend that they were yeah. but it was too late then so then when we got joe wiley on who i'd worked with on radio four so uh, on series uh, two and then for half of series three you know, she she booked the bands, and then we moved it up that notch, mm -hmm. so they, it was a bit more relaxed about what we were doing, except for her not putting to take that on. Terrible, yeah. but you know what I mean. So then we started yeah. getting it in the right direction, and we were lucky because of the stuff that was around. You know, we we had to kiss. We, we didn't have to kiss that many frogs to find the princes. We, we were better at it than every other show. And mm. um, Katie, you were talking earlier about how there was a point when PR started to get savvy mm. about the the bare pit of 
the programme. And obviously some of these acts might have been interviewed as well. Yeah. I was also struck, and I wanted to ask both of you, maybe Katie first, there was a growth in the sort of reality TV element of the word, you know, the... the de- I want to say the deplorables, but I'm confusing that with politics. The hopefuls. The hopefuls. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that was after Katie had been on. That was series four. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's horrible. It was just like a gimmick. So we should just say these were members of the public, and the idea was, I'll do anything to be on yes. television, anything to be famous. Well, what, it's like kissing a granny without her false teeth in. Yes. I know, Terry, you felt that that it might have had a direct effect on guests' willingness. Good no, no, I knew, I knew even... I, I mean, I, I was really against it because I was against any gimmick or contrivance. I wasn't shocked by anything, mm. you know, given where I'd grown up. You know, it was sort of hard to be shocked by anything. But I just thought, the minute you start re- making a show rely on a contrivance or a gimmick, it kills you because you, how, you've got to top it every week. So it got to the stage where we were getting good guests turning us down and, it, and even bands turning us down because they didn't want to be competing with some bloke from Stoke-on-Trent eating a worm, a worm sandwich. Yeah, eating corns. You know, how do so you look what? back on the music and its role in the show and all these issues? Well, um, I'm very proud of being associated with it. Um, I mean, I would say a, a, a counter-argument to Terry's point is um, maybe the bands didn't like it, but the viewer sure as hell loved it. I mean, I still get people today who want to talk to me about the hopefuls and all that stuff. But it and became, the hopefuls became something that, that they went on about a lot in the press. So it's a mm. bit like, you know, when people talk about George Best, if you didn't see him play football, you talk about him being drunk on Wogan. Right. But it was what he did on that pitch at Old Trafford that counts. Likewise, likewise with Oliver Reed. Yeah. It was how great an actor he was and not his boozing. Well, I think uh, in the whole scheme of things, when you're watching an episode of The Word, that was the hopefuls, or the, that element was just a part of the whole potpourri. But the reason why the hopefuls actually, I know you want to talk about the music, but... No, no, no talk, I about want to talk about the hopefuls. Um, <laughs> we can talk the, about every night. Like. It, it, um, that kind of got consolidated into its own standalone item because I was the one that had to do all those uh, studio segments oh, before. Yeah. So bef- mm-hmm. so I was the one that had to do the, hey, this guy's going to eat some maggots. <laughs> and hey, guess what? This guy can snort a condom up his nose and hawk it out his mouth and then floss. But we didn't do it every single week, no, no. did we? You know, it was so like, it, it, it was, it was, it was like a bit a, of fun. Yeah, it was like a funny, like, sideshow, freak show. Student pranks, you yeah, know. Yeah, student but... pranks kind of thing, which actually, I have to say, the thing I always... Um, point out about the word is that it really was the petri dish of all television that was to come so it was like the little germ of reality television going into somebody's life and you know somebody having a penis extension now that would be an entire series about that or you know they did the word search where they did a whole hour on who's it going to be is it going to be Davina McCall is it going to be Jess Nelson oh it's Katie Puckrick that would have been an entire series not just an episode Um, same with these crazy stunts that was a tv show that was huge in America jackass but the music, my God, that's something that, um, you know, to this day and age, we can take a lot of pride in. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with it, but, you know, I was there. Is it partly about the moment? Because I was trying to look at what was going on in the sort of world of music, mm. and you didn't yet have streaming to take, you know, well, of course people it was, were still it was buying before, records. Yeah, and it was before social media. It was before, um, certainly before... Uh, digital listening, which changed the way we listen to music forever. So, you know, the way that we can now cherry pick music and pick and choose, and it's not about artists and albums and all that sort of thing. So it really was a one-stop shopping to go to the word, you know, a destination situation where well, you're seeing the artists that are in the charts. Nearly every band wanted to come on. The difficulty, I mean, I managed to get most Manchester bands on who were any good at the time, but there was a kind of laziness where they just think, I mean, even when we had Oasis on, which is the last series of Series 4, the objection from our then music booker to having them on was, but Terry, you know, we've already got what a Manchester band booked on that show. <laughs> so I said, so you can't have two Manchester bands on the same and, show. And this Manchester was yeah. happening. But, then, but it so. always was anyway. Yeah. And it was like, well, you know, so you wouldn't have two bands from London on the same show. Right, exactly. When London's not had a music scene since fucking punk in 1976. Ooh, All you've produced more. since then was like Chaz and Dave. <laughs> and it was like, um, so it, it, you get these ridiculous arguments and... But in the end, we've got everyone. The one band that they wouldn't have on were the Cranberries. And I went mad about it. Because, so we could have had them on doing Linger, but Paul Ross wouldn't have them on. And Paul Ross turned down um, Paul Weller because he was over the age of 30. <laughs> Good thing we were allowed to be on it then. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> but we look so fresh. Yeah. Um, how would you both sum up how you feel about the programme now, looking back on it and its impact? You've 
commented on the fact that it's changed reality television. It's actually the petri dish for all these things that are now huge. Phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of times uh, people and also people in the industry uh, get very wistful about the word and say, oh, it would be great to, to have that moment again, bring it back. And you just can't really do that, you know, because the, uh, you know, the maidenhead has been, has been torn asunder. Uh, and, and we are, nice we, and we, we are no longer innocent and, uh, we've seen it all before, but that, this was the perfect show at the perfect time and also the perfect time in Britain, which was having, you know, it was such a low self-esteem country for so long, especially after the war, you know, you guys have been really beaten up and hard times and, <laughs> Really, I'm, I'm really fascinated by your time scale. At the it 90s. really was. She went after the Falklands War. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I moved here in the 80s, and you know, it was all like coins and meters to get a little bit of electricity, and it was very primitive. Thatcherism. You guys, you did, you, you know, you drank like weird cordials that you had to put water into to, to make uh, fake orange juice. It was very like, it, it was very like war rations all the time. Um, I just, you know, you couldn't get coffee or cocktails, and you know, it's strange. But um, but I soldiered on bravely. <laughs> the only the only third world country where it was safe to drink the water. <laughs> I, I just no. I remember you guys. You you'd advertise ice cubes and stuff. <laughs> so, we didn't have a fridge till I was fourteen. This is what I'm talking about. Exhibit A. So um, <laughs> we, we had the one thing money can't buy: poverty. Yeah. So. Um, so this is all to say that by the time the 90s rolled around, that is when, like, especially in London, um, it kind of, everything coalesced in Britain, you know, had a, you know, the music scene was really having a rave that was exciting. Oh my God, Britpop, that coalesced. Um, and, and the rest of the world was paying attention. America was mm. paying attention. And so, and the word was part of that. It was really exciting. There was really a sense that we were in the middle of, a scene, you know, we weren't clawing, you know, us certainly being on the show, but also British people. I think that was the beauty of the word was that it was very inclusive because we all knew we were all part of this and we were contributing to it and responsible for the, the, it. The whole idea of the word was not to try and be cool because we naturally were. You know what I mean? We, we had, you know, we certainly, you know, the, the background in it all, and it was to keep that glass between you and the audience as thin as possible. So. I know it sounds stupid, but I was a bit sudy where I would never go to, like, launch parties or anything like that. Uh, I think the only one that I ever went to, really, uh, uh, was the one where we got paid to go to Dublin. I don't Do you remember, remember that. It was for the opening of the pod. John Reynolds, Albert Reynolds' son, the, the former Tisha's son. Oh, wow. And we, we got paid about two grand each to go and just drink there. Wow. Um, I don't that, remember that. I think it was just the year after the word had finished. and um, but, it, but it was like... You know, because I felt that, you know, because we're aimed at, at the youth. And it kept me away from doing coke, um, which, which was unusual in TV in those circles in the 90s. Because, you know, obviously I, I came from an area where 17-year-olds were killing each other to sell the stuff. Mm. So it wouldn't have been quite right for me to do that. You know, and, and there was a certain sense of, I suppose, a conscientiousness and a responsibility there. I mean, if I look back on the word, it could have been three times better than it was. Other people tried to steal elements from it because we were much brighter individuals than we were given credit for, including by the people who made the show. Mm. And, uh, you know, so we could have pushed it out more. What was interesting was when they remade TFI a few years ago, and I know, I know Chris Evans, and it was like they had, uh, you know, TFI Friday, the album, and all those bands were on the word. Yeah. They weren't actually on TFI. You know, the Happy Mondays had split up before TFI started. Uh, they never had New Order on. They never had the Stone Roses on. Uh, you know, the Boo Radley's Wake Up Boo was on the word, not on TFI Friday. You know, so it was quite weird how you felt as if they'd almost like sequestered everything you'd done and made it for a show whose figures were going down after series one that had like twice the budget we had because our figures went up every year. And, you know, so, so it was interesting that they never, they messed about with it too much. If they'd have kept Katie on and kept us comfortable and not kept messing around like that and allowed it to develop, it, it was a really strong show. I want to take questions, but just before we do, why did you leave Katie after? Well, there were other series? opportunities. Politics. I, I, was get, I was frustrated because I felt like I was, um, I mean, 2020 hindsight, I probably shouldn't have left the word but I was frustrated and I, I felt like there was more I could do but looking back on it it's like why did I think uh, one you know a, 
uh, doing a studio event had higher status than doing an outside broadcast. It didn't. It was just, and in fact, I always had to do the, the outside, live outside broadcasts were really tricky, and in fact, it was sort of a compliment to me that. It's quite sexist, though, as well, wasn't it? Yeah, anyway. But um, <laughs> but I had, but I created, you know, I, I left and did um, uh, the Sunday show, which was another live uh, current events thing, uh, like jokey satire type thing on. Peter K. And, uh, yeah, he did it after I left, though. And then I created a show, Pajama Party, for ITV. So I had other fish to fry. I had other opportunities. It, it was it was far more schizophrenic than that. And then the, the people who were obsessed with getting it in the papers were uh, Charlie Parsons and, and the actual bosses of The Word. So they would employ uh, people like Neil Redding and uh, Mark Bukowski later on. And their job was basically to feed any old shite to the tabloids because I was forever being, you know, there'd be a story uh, sent to the sun that I was in hiding. And then I'd get Piers Morgan to ring me up at home, you know, while I was watching the football. And it'd be like, uh, uh, Terry, I believe you're in hiding. I said, and that's why you've just rung me on my landline at, at my house. You know, do me a favour and fuck off. Um, so it, it, there was a lot of that which did interfere with your life a lot. You know, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of the people, you know, I mean, there's one particular editor on The Word who was always doing this, you know, and, like, making stories up that you would then have to deal with while you were trying to do your job and make the show that he was editing good. So a, a lot of it was about them. It wasn't about the show. And uh, certainly with Channel 4, it wasn't a show they chose to do. They didn't quite get it. But what it was was the figures were so good, they were frightened of it. It wasn't the sort of thing that they'd do. They hated me being working class. They hated me coming from the north. You know, I, I was... Uh, I don't think there was a, a, a series of that show where I wasn't told, you know, you're lined up for the sack. Now, that doesn't really fill you full of self-belief when you've got to do a live show on a Friday night, which is a very difficult show because it had live elements to yeah. it, had links, you know, adverts... <laughs> everything um and then you've got to have the self-belief to do that and, and it was tough yeah. and it, and you were dealing with a lot of people who were inexperienced you know because when people would, would be suddenly put on you're producing this show i can remember i'd have a guest on i'm interviewing them then suddenly the 300 people in the audience have turned round to look because they've set up the rear of the year competition on the stage <laughs> so i had to say look don't let me expect you know i'm not an expert but why don't you do that during a taped item you fuckwit. I didn't quite, I didn't say that. I used to just think it. But, it. but it used to be, you know, it was quite hard to bite your tongue sometimes. But no, Channel 4 didn't like the word. It, you know, it was quite unusual. I, I actually remember um, at the time meeting Johnny Vaughan and going up the steps to, uh, the, you know, Channel 4. And it was like uh, Michael Grade came out. And he went, hello, Terry. And he went, uh, Johnny, we must do lunch sometime. You've got a, we've got, you've got a big future in this organisation. I'm going... I get four times the figures that twat gets. <laughs> what about my future? Exactly. The job centre. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was and I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't able for it, you know, I, I, that, to get that amount of attention, you know, coming, coming from the sort of background that I did. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about just the working class element. I'm talking about, you know, the family situation and everything else. I don't know if, if I had a coat very comfortably. What was quite funny was I did a two-way with her peers, when Jose Mourinho got, Jose Mourinho, sorry, got the job at Manchester United, and I hated him, you know, because I knew how dull his football was and joyless. And, uh, um, Piers was, you know, so it was, I was outside Old Trafford, and Piers was trying to say to me, look, he's great, blah, blah, blah. And I was, and at the end, Piers said, well, thank you, Terry. And I said, and thank you, Piers. That's the first time you've actually asked me a question and not made up the answer yourself. <laughs> he still does that now. Oh, yeah. Well, well, he, well he once did a double page spread of, on me called Terry Christian 20 of My Favourite Things. I never even spoke to him. <laughs> well, it was the hottest ticket in town, wasn't it? For a time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people, I mean, I still have people who say to me in social media, you know, how excited they were to, it was like kind of a golden ticket. How did they get those golden tickets? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, they invited people down from all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes be, some of them would be fans of the band. Yeah. The worst thing for them is they'd all be in the pub, but then they had to get in the studio for 10 o'clock. Yeah. And then they weren't allowed to leave till 12. So they'd all be like weeing, you know, you know near the cameras and everything like that. <laughs> because they, they couldn't hold it that long. Uh, the worst one they ever did was they played a trick on a, a coach load of people from Manchester where 
you know, they, they made their coach journey last for eight hours. And so they just arrived when the show finished. And I went mental at Paul Ross because, you know, that, that's like treating your audience like shit and it's not funny. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I got the blame for it as well, not him. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, it, it, it was... Uh, it was like a bear pit, but it was good. They were excited. I mean, that was the thing is when I'd be in the middle of that crowd, you know, doing some sort of kooky item or another, the people, you know, the excitement was palpable. You know, yeah. People were just so thrilled to be there. And, um, yeah, it was great. But I do remember that the celebrities, especially the American ones who were on the, on stage, were often very taken aback by, right. by that energy. Oh, right on top of them, yeah. No yeah. protection. Yeah, no protection. Well, I actually had, uh, what is it, this mad girl once come up and slap me on the face. And then the following week, I had like two bouncers at either side All of right, me, you know. Cool. It would really, I mean, I'm, I'm only like 5'7", <laughs> you know, maybe five seven and a half at a push. But these guys are about five foot two, but, you know, like little kickboxers. So you wouldn't really see them. But they were just there in case. In a sense, what you've put your finger on is there's a kind of innocence, in a way, about the word. And only yeah. in the sense that, yeah. no, no, well, in the sense that you would have an audience right up there with yes. big celebrities. In a way, now there's so much anxiety about, you know, attacks and things that you just wouldn't dare do that. There'd be too much concern. I, th I, about think, I think there was a certain danger. vibe. I mean, yeah, it was. It was well. It was that continuation of the idea of having a club, you know, just inside that television set. And it and it really was like a club. There was there was nothing grandiose. You know, you were that the whole idea was you were kind of on their level. You know, and you were, you know, what I mean, I mean, there was a lot of vulnerability with us on the word, and I think mm -hmm. that's what you never got with other shows, and that's what you know. I mean, inside, I, I was just a fourteen year old anyway. You know, even though I was like you know thirty when I started doing the show, that's how I felt about myself. So I suppose people could feel that. You know, I wasn't confident. I wasn't full of all of. Of this stuff, and well, there's one thing some people are very frightened of vulnerability, but others will embrace it. The one thing Paul Ross said, which I think hopefully you both agree with, is that he feels a lot of live television goes to huge lengths to be so controlled that actually it might as well not be live. And the thing about the word is, mm. as you say, there's an element of the vulnerability of when you're not quite in control of guests, the whole there's so much going on, and it makes it feel genuinely live and exciting. And I think <laughs> that's really significant, and you rarely see that now. Oh, what, what Thank is you it for like? asking that. No, I, um, I mean, it was a weird one because I first met him and he was a stand-up comedian and, and I think the feeling on the show was that you had two series and it was a new commission editor at Channel 4 and he didn't really want it to be the Terry Christian show. So Mark came in as a, a stand-up comedian to be working on The Big Breakfast and, uh, hell, I mean, I, I don't know. What, what, what do you think, Mark Lamar? Well... Cluster he, B? He, um was you know we talked just now about vulnerability mm -hmm. and he was somebody who was not confident enough to be vulnerable he was very guarded and very uh tense and you know scared of not being seen to be in control like he couldn't kind of roll with it it, it was almost like uh I, I mean i got on with him all right until one day uh, i'd done that show business you know with uh, mike smith on on uh, bbc one and it was just one of those shows that you do. It paid all right. You know, it was a bit of fun. And uh, so I, I put a word in for him on the show because obviously if you're going on like, you know, Saturday evening shows at six o'clock where you get eight million viewers for showing a baboon's ass, then, then basically that's, that's quite good for a show like ours, which is on a Friday night. And in, in the middle of the word office, I saw Mark said, oh, Mark, I was on that show business last week, but I put a word in for the producer with you. And rather than saying, yeah, not really my cup of tea, thanks, Terry, he went like that. What the fuck would I want to go on a show like that? So I just said, because you're desperate for everyone to know who you are. <laughs> so it was all a bit downhill from there, from yeah. then on. But, it, but it, was, it was one of those things where it, it was that schizophrenia with Mark because he kind of wanted to be on TV. I don't think the word was the right vehicle for him, but his, his uh, manager was really good, Alison Cresswell. You know, God rest his soul. He, 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 you know, and, and Mark was young, so he was the right era. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it was something very weird, you know, because he was from Swindon, but had like the Cockney accent. And I mean, like I said, he, he, he could I be a nice bloke, scene. but he just seemed odd. There was that in the montage. Yeah. There was that weird scene where he's sort of play punching you, but it kind of looks quite weird. Oh, um, that I don't know what uh, he is play punching me there, but um, he was not happy. I think that was the. There, there was a hypnotist who came on that hypnotized a whole bunch of guys uh, to make them 
wanted one of them to take a bath and some big beans yeah, or yeah, something like right. that. And then I think he, the hypnotist, said to the guys, "Okay, go jump on. You know, Mark's your football coach, and you've just won a match. So go like get excited with him." And so they all like ruffled up his hair, and he got so angry and so like he just. I think you're right. Like he was so talented and so good and a fresh face, but he was very invested in seeming cool at all times. So like the show wasn't the right show for him because it was, you had to kind of like, you couldn't control this thing. It was a runaway train. Um, but he, I mean, he and I got along fine until, you know, the, until we didn't. Um, <laughs> until we didn't. <laughs> Because uh, there was that, that final episode of season three where there was a setup with a hidden camera. This in Margie Clark. Oh, yeah, Margie yeah. Margie Clark in your, changing, in your dressing room and also, and the idea was Margie Clark was supposed to come in and, and like... Come on to us. Put, put the moves on and then like, there'd be, you know, hilarity would ensue and then, uh, and he found out about it before because he was in the makeup chair getting ready before the show and they ran it on the monitor in the makeup room of me doing the setup like we're gonna have a hidden camera <laughs> you'll never guess it's gonna be crazy and Marky Clark's gonna blah, blah, blah. and he saw the whole thing and so I was on a shit list after that um and he, didn't he um he had got very angry with he had Charlie Parsons by the lapels up against yeah. the wall. No, by the throat. Oh, by the by throat. The okay, sorry, the wrong part of the body. Well, when I had a bit of a to-do with him, I mean, it never came to blows, even though this became like, you know, the, the sort of big uh, thing. But it was like, uh, I, Charlie actually said to me, Terry, you shouldn't be winding him up. Yeah. And, I, and so when that happened to Charlie, I said, yeah. Charlie, you shouldn't wind him up. No. <laughs> I kind of feel this he might... Was bit, he was a bit wound up, per perpetually wound up. But, you know, he's... He, I don't know why. I guess he just had a. He was a bit chippy. That's all. We are kind of out of time, but I think we should end with both of you kind of offering a final word on the word. What would you like to add? Um, Especially when you imagine in the future, in fifty years, the BFI will be hosting, you know, a season looking back seventy years at the. We'll, 90s. All, we'll all reconvene, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> and I just wonder, you know, what will then, you know, how will it, it hold up then? Because I think. We've talked about how innovative it was and how it's changed television. I wonder if you have any more thoughts about um, its legacy. I, I mean, I, I knew that people would still be... It was quite funny when we did the best of the word in 1999, which is basically edited down versions. Um, I remember a journalist, because the, they always hated us. There was never, there was no remit. I think, I think the only people in the media who ever said they liked the word were Ned Sherring. Do you remember him on Radio 4? <laughs> <Lucent>. right? <laughs> and he used to send me postcards all the time, and he, he'd have me on it. And, uh, <laughs> and Tony Parsons once gave us a good write-up, but the rest of the time, you know, we were like from hell, you know. I, so I was always a moron, cerebrally challenged, the worst presenter on TV, blah de blah de blah um, But... Uh, I actually knew because we had those elements of that Hitman and Hurish, that inclusiveness, that uh, that thing with So It Goes and Tony Wilson, and you know that we would be part of people's youth, that they would remember us for that, for the good and the bad, and for how they felt at the time and how they felt about themselves because we weren't cool and it was something that you know that, that was inclusive. So if you were a black kid, you always saw someone black on the show. If you were homosexual, they'd be, they'd be treated in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. You know, we were for everyone. You know, we were for every man in that way That's and done in, done in a not worthy way. And I remember this journalist saying, he said, the worst thing about the word coming back would be it would mean that Terry Christian might be right and people were still talking about it in 10 years' time. And I, and I remember reading it and said, no, mate, I said 20 years' time. <laughs> Katie, what about you? Well, I think looking at these clips and talking about it, thinking about the word, it sort of reminds me of, um, you know, when I was a teenager and I'd look at clips of Swing in London um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, TV, little clips of pop music things or like some old Beatles, uh, you know, proto videos. And... I would look at those those little artifacts of pop culture and just feel so misty-eyed about it, like, oh, I wish I could have been there, and that just looks like the coolest thing in the world. And now I think the word has that that same gravitas. It seems it's it's a total um, just a, a time capsule of of our youth and of a very particular time in Britain when, as I say, I think, you know, Britain was really feeling its oats. It was on top of the world. And so I think it's a real beautiful thing because of that.